Welcome to the Low Carb USA podcast, where we seek to inspire you to help us build this community. I'm Doug Reynolds. And this is Pam Devine. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Um, we're very honored today to have Maggie and Brad Jones here. We're going to start with Maggie. She's got a very powerful story of healing. And then after that, they'll tell us about the work they're doing to raise awareness. Welcome, Maggie and Brad. Thank you. Thank you for having us today, guys. Doug, we're so honored. We've been fans for a very long time. (laughs) Thank you for all the work you do. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, But it's like, yeah, people like you supersede anything we've done. So, (laughs) not really. We're all in it together. Uh, Amazing. We really are. Tell your story, and people will see what I'm talking about. So my story really begins when Brad and I left Los Angeles to move to Hong Kong, and we'd never been to Asia before. We moved one week before my 40th birthday, and it was exactly one month later that I was diagnosed with terminal cancer. It was lung cancer primarily. It had by then spread to two tumors in my eye, two in my brain, uh, over a dozen in my lymph nodes throughout my neck, chest, and abdomen. My prognosis was about six to eight months. I didn't think I would ever see the end to Game of Thrones. And now I kind of wish I hadn't. (laughs) But honestly, my first instinct was like, okay, this is it. I want to die well. I want to make Brad proud of me and my oncologist proud of me. And luckily that lasted about a week. And the first weekend after my diagnosis, I thought, no, I want to live. And I started reading a ton of books by so many uh, practitioners and healers that we're proud to now consider friends. And those really helped guide me towards my metabolic treatment. And I want to emphasize that I never gave up on conventional therapy. I did do uh, a targeted chemotherapy radiation for my brain. We'll talk about more later. But all of this was supplanted by my growing understanding of the metabolic therapies. So for me, it started with uh, keto and eating a low carbohydrate diet, really eating only foods that would actively heal me was my plan. I decided if it wasn't a medicine in food form, it wasn't in my body. So I kicked it off that first weekend Mm -hmm. with a fast. I didn't, I'd never fasted before since I was like a little girl. Uh, And so for one day I didn't eat anything. And when we started again, I sent poor Brad around to every grocery store in Hong Kong, finding organic whole foods that would work. I knew sugar wasn't going to be a part of this plan. I knew that alcohol couldn't be a part of this plan. Although I was a great alcohol enthusiast in my previous life. Uh, And we moved forward that way. And so that was in October of 2018. And it wasn't until February of 2019 that I actually got my hands on a keto mojo and was finally able to actually test my blood glucose and ketone levels. And I was doing brilliantly. I can't even tell you, I think the first four months is how long my first treatment lasted. And by the end, I had seen tumors shrinking. I could see again, I'd been blind in my eye. It was a miracle. And so we just kept going. We uh, By then I would had one round of brain radiation radio surgery and i did have another one coming up as two new brain tumors had developed but we just kept going with it and now that i had the actual numbers behind the kind of progress i was making i could perfect it and i was able to get my uh, gki the glucose ketone index that dr thomas safri talks about in some of his research down to the optimal therapeutic level under 1.0 And then I think that's when Brad started to see the success I was having and decided to join me in the way we were eating. At this point, we were fasting all day, every day, Monday. So for about a 44 hour fast, we're eating OMAD one meal a day, uh, the rest of the week. And then we would indulge on the weekend with maybe two meals a day, some chia seed pudding, something crazy like that. Uh, But it was one year later, exactly one year after my diagnosis that my scans showed no evidence of disease. Um, I was just fine. And I, I, I'm still amazed. Uh, there have been other issues since then. You may hear in my voice, I don't speak as eloquently as I used to. I have something called brain radiation necrosis caused by my previous treatment. So those four tumors that were in my brain were all irradiated. And over a year or two, they've developed their own swelling, their own issues as a result of that treatment. And so I do have some seizures now, uh, But amazingly, keto and a low carb lifestyle are also great for seizures. (laughs) They're great for a lot of brain injuries. Uh, And it's been working for me brilliantly. And I was telling Doug earlier, the reason that 
this has been such a mystery and so many doctors don't know how to cure it is that so few people get to live as long as I have. I've been two years cancer free now, over three years since my diagnosis. And honestly, I never thought I would get this far. And these little issues in my brain are nothing. <laughs> I mean, we were just talking about the fact that uh, this idea that Maggie's been cancer free for two years, she's not dealing with cancer anymore. She's dealing with the repercussions of the cancer treatment. She's dealing with all the side effects that came out of the chemotherapy drugs that she took. And so, and the radiation, I guess you'd say, but mostly radiation. And so that's very frustrating. Um, and then another thing that we were talking about recently was the keto mojo. We were talking about last night, how she was really trying to be ketogenic, but she didn't realize how far off she was until she actually got a keto mojo. She was, she got the keto mojo. She thought she was down near a one for a GKI. She was hoping and she was like that a five. Right. And she's like, man, I really thought I was like killing it. And I just sort of, you know, for all the viewers out there that think that you can just eat broccoli and be good. You know, it's like, it really helps to have something that's really telling you where you really are. So if you can um, measure, then you know, if you can measure, then you know, yeah, that's a good way. I it. think that's, that's uh, like Dorian, Dorian Greeno is the, the, the guy that basically developed the Keto Mojo and that, that's his thing. Like that's how he even started it because he, he needed for himself to be able to measure, yeah. uh, measure those levels. And uh, Said, if, you, if you can't measure, you're done now. Yeah. It's been a godsend. And so my next steps after that, I had been working in media. I was the vice president of product at the Los Angeles Times, Tribune Publishing. I took over as the vice president of Newsroom Systems at the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong. And I knew from just my experience that a lot of what was contributing to my condition was the stress. And so I knew I had to let that go. And I wanted to help people. And so I started this blog initially to just inform my friends and family about my treatment, how it was going. And it turned into this giant repository of metabolic treatments that I was using and the research I was doing. And more and more people were inspired by it. I started a social media group and I got so many questions about how do you implement this? Nobody, the word's just not out there. So I studied as a nutritionist and I actually started my own practice and helped people one-on-one. -on -one but I realized I can't do everything one-on-one. -on -one. And so I roped in my filmmaker husband and he had a genius idea. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, uh, I mean, I remember her just trying to be a consultant and that was, you know, she was just trying to help people and like go one-on-one. -on -one. And I, I swear like she would talk to like three people a day and 10 new people would email her. Like, mm -hmm. I want to be, you know, talk, I want to talk Cure to my cancer. And, it's just... and it was just, I mean, it was kind of tearing her apart. She was, she's not a psychologist, like just dealing with this after, after just going through it herself, it was just very emotionally wrenching. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I would basically like, she would get off the consultations with some of these people literally like breaking down. I would just be like, Hey, you're doing a good thing. I know it's hard. You know, you can quit whenever you want, but you know, you are doing something that's, that's great. And she's like, I just have to find a bigger, an easier way to get this out to more people. So she actually wrote before we decided to even do a documentary for like half a book. Um, the rest she, coming out soon. <laughs> yeah, she designed a, like a training course that I mean, these are both things that might still make their way out into the, the world. But I mean, she was just like, how can I do this? How can I get this out? Um, and so around this time where this kind of stuff was going on, um, we had been in Europe. I was, we were in London actually, while I was finishing up an MBA in the middle of a crazy pandemic, we were, we, they canceled classes there at the last second. So we just kind of got stranded in London. Um, and so this happened, we came back to the States and when we got back to the States, I was like, maybe we could just make a documentary about this. And that's kind of how this got rolling, this whole idea of doing the cancer revolution documentary. Um, and I will add one more story to that. At the time, I was talking with a nutritionist in Scandinavia whose brother had just been diagnosed with GBM, uh, glioblastoma, which is well known to be very well treated with a ketogenic diet and metabolic therapies. She was trying to explain this to her poor brother who had a handful of months left to live. And he just wasn't in a position where he could read books or read my articles or even talk to me on the phone. He needed the simplest way to get this information into his brain so that he could, he could then take the steps. Uh, and unfortunately, we didn't have anything at that time. We tried recording some phone calls with him, him and his sister, and we couldn't 
convince him that this was something that could prolong his life or you know improve his outcomes and unfortunately he's passed now but in my heart he is one of the people that this documentary is dedicated to because if more people knew more people would have the chance to live lives like Pablo Kelly is a case study participant who's had seven years now had a, got married and had a child with glioblastoma because uh he knew about it and there's so many out there and there could be so many more yeah Definitely one of the hardest things about anything that isn't um, been hasn't had enough research about it done to be um, have been rubber stamped by the FDA. You know, it's this stuff is not proven, but it's not disproven. It needs more research. Yeah. Um, and and you know, people go in they're like, well, my oncologist didn't tell me about it, so it must not be true. That's not true. There's all kinds of stuff that hasn't been proven yet that, it, you know, it's so it hasn't been rubber stamped by the FDA. That does not mean it's not true. We're still, we're finding new drugs are getting approved every day. Well, yesterday you wouldn't have taken that drug and today you will. So, you know, so it's like, yeah, we're, it's a work in progress. It's all a work in progress. So, but yeah, that can be very frustrating. So Brad mentioned this documentary and in 2021, we actually spent the year traveling the country, talking to my heroes, these people who had written books, had done the research that helped save my life. So the, so we have, I mean, I have some editing background and Maggie has some project management background, um, but we were just like, can we even pull this off, right? Like, could we make a feature length Netflix, Netflix quality like documentary? And we were, we basically were like, well, we have like these two people that we were like, if we can get these two people on board, we think we might be able to make it. And it was uh, uh, Thomas Seyfried, who's obviously huge in this world, and then Travis Christofferson. And we actually had a connection to Travis because Maggie had gone through the care oncology clinic um, for their sort of um, off-label drug protocol. So these are uh, metformin, what are the? Membendazole, which you might hear a lot of talk about Joe Tippin's protocol. Uh, Membendazole is a human version of that uh, animal dewormer that he takes. It's a torvastatin, which is your con standard uh, Lipitor type uh, statin. And finally, doxycycline alternating. So it's these four drugs, very common, very low side effects that they've shown really great success treating primarily glue, Blastorma initially, but many, many other tumors uh, since then. So for me, with lung cancer primarily, it, it was a no-brainer. Yeah. And so, so Maggie was, while she was working with her regular oncologist, she was also working with an oncologist from this care oncology clinic on these off-label, um, on these off-label drugs. And so when the, uh, we went to a metabolic health summit, met with her oncologist from care oncology there, and Travis Christofferson was there. So we got to meet him. And so then a few months later, when we were talking about this documentary, we were like, let, like, we think we could reach out to Travis and he would get back to us and, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down. And he might be able to help get Safe Read on board since he, you know, knew him. And we're so thankful that Travis took a chance on us and said, yes, he got Safe Read on board and said, yes. And then it was just like a bunch of dominoes falling once we had these two great names on board for the documentary. Um, I wouldn't say people came out of the woodwork to join the documentary. <laughs> Some of them did, <laughs> but uh, but it became much much easier. And yeah, we um, we did a sort of whirlwind tour of the country, um, interviewing amazing scientists, researchers, uh, medical doctors to to be part of this documentary. Uh, that's amazing. I uh, um, I think we were talking in a, in a previous call we had when we were talking about doing this podcast, and uh, we told you a very similar story. Uh, about Pam's um, uncle, who who was diagnosed, and literally at, at during our very first conference, he was in the lounge on a cot, basically with people coming to visit him to say goodbye. And we were expecting to hear during the conference that that he had passed. And in the end, he actually passed a, a few days after the conference, and we ended up on a plane to go to the funeral. But the same thing, you know, we had heard about it months earlier. And I tried to convince him to at least try something that might might help, you know. And because their oncologist or whatever didn't tell them, they don't believe it. Who are we? We're just an engineer and a radiology tech, right? And um, so they, they just won't believe you. And I, I still think if it was their doctor, their oncologist who had told them to try this, they may well have tried it. And that's the, that, that's the, 
really disappointing part of this. Yeah. And the fact that there's no downside to it. The worst part is you can't drink beer and eat pizza every day for however many days you have left in this world. But the fact is that's going to end sometime anyway. And if you can prolong that and have a better quality of life, there's absolutely no reason you can't follow these treatments with or without your conventional treatment. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's well, heartbreaking. And that's another kind of interesting twist to the ketogenic diet where a lot of doctors are like, oh, it's not safe, right? It's like, well, you know what? If you have a child with epilepsy, it is a prescribed treatment, right? It's FDA approved. It's FDA approved. <laughs> they give it to little children. But yet your doctor might be like, well, I don't know. You as an adult might not be able to handle it. You know, it's kind of... Better uh, to die from cancer. I mean, I'm not a months. doctor. I don't know the ins and outs of this, but that... To me, that just, just sort of seems a little iffy in my brain, right? <laughs> Michael Greger, who is a, a scientist that I very much respect, and I love his information on a plant-based diet, but he has a video out where he says, why keto when you can chemo? And I'm like, well, I've had chemo, and I can tell you a million reasons why I prefer keto. Yeah. <laughs> and they go together. <sighs> anyway, but that's very much the mindset. Even my doctor said, he was very concerned about my cholesterol going with a ketogenic diet. It's like, am I going to live to be 50 and heart disease? Like, where do you think my cholesterol is the biggest concern that I have with stage four cancer spread to my brain and everywhere else? Yeah. Uh, it's just not a lot of, of thinking. Well, and then, I mean, she started to go into a little bit. One of the amazing things that they're starting to discover about ketosis is that, uh, not like when you when, let's say you fast before you go in and have a, either chemotherapy or radiation it's starting to they're starting to see that it does this amazing thing where when you're fasting your normal cells they kind of like close up and it's like you know like when you don't feel well you kind of go into a cold corner and roll up into a ball well in a in a sort of sense that's what your normal cells are doing when you go on to fast but cancer cells don't do that. They're still out like looking for anything that they can get to grow, looking for glucose. And so what happens is, is that you, inter uh, you, you hit the body with a radiation or chemotherapy and the, all the cancer cells are open to it and all the normal cells are closed off. So it's turning out to be, you know, as, the, as we get more and more research, it's turning out to really be an amazing way to fight cancer. And to reduce the side effects. One more story I have yeah. to tell. I've had two rounds of stereotactic brain radiation, as I mentioned, for four tumors. The first one, which I guess was in November of 2018, I was trying to eat healthy, like I said, eat only healing foods. Went to the hospital, got my brain radiation, came home and was so sick for three weeks. I was in bed, sweating, vomiting. One of the worst experiences I've had with cancer. Uh, in April 2019, just fewer than six months later, I had two more brain tumors, got the same treatment, exactly the same treatment for them, walked home from the hospital on that Friday, went to work that Monday feeling great. And the difference between those two experiences was fasting. The second one, I had water fasted three days in advance after having read uh, Walter Longo's research out of USC, and it was night and day. I, and it's hard to tell people, don't eat. <laughs> But my gosh, I, I'm never going against the radiation that I had, but the changes in the side effects made it so clear that it was a different experience and possibly a different effectiveness. I, I, you said it's difficult to tell people uh, not to eat, but one of the things about being ketogenic is that makes that so much easier. It does. Be because so your brain, is, your, your, your body's already processing fats uh, in order to produce ketones to basically support, it, support its functions. And now suddenly you don't eat, it's just carrying on doing the same thing. And I, I've, I'd have, I don't actually do extended fast, but I've heard you know, anecdotes from other people who have who said like they literally don't feel hungry and they don't, they don't struggle with it. Whereas if you try and introduce someone to a three-day fast, and then they're not ketogenic. That, that's got to be really tough. Yeah. Yeah, that really is the exact difference. And I've helped people through it before. And I can't emphasize enough that just getting your body into that state of ketosis in advance will make the world of difference. Yeah. Uh, I've done as long as nine days water fasting was my longest. Uh, and I don't find that there's benefit beyond three to five days for me personally. But like you say, after, after you get used to or 
get over the habit of eating and you realize your body's not hungry. I've got plenty of fat on my body that it can digest and it'll be, you know, filled back up with all these healing foods that I eat when I break my fast. It's just, there's no reason to be concerned. Yeah. Yeah. So my doctors do. Oh, they, they are concerned because of the fear of cachexia, which is the wasting that comes in the very late stages of cancer. And I actually did lose over 50 pounds when I first started my way of eating. And my doctors uh, were probably terrified that this was cachexia. This was the very end for me. They knew it was a matter of months. But the research shows now, and we've been fortunate to interview some researchers whose original uh, science has proven this, Keto can prevent cachexia. It actually uh, prevents that muscle wasting and allows you to burn more fat, as we know, rather than the muscles. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, in fact, uh, I was like, we just spoke with Miriam Kalanium last month and she, she was pounding on this. She was just like, doctors are telling their patients not to go keto because they're, they're scared of cachexia. And she was like, unless you are two weeks away from death, she's like, keto is is still fine for patients to use and can, can really help them. Yeah, Adrian so. Sheck, Angela Poff, both have an enormous amount of experience in this area. And the research is just clear. It's just, our doctors yeah. don't know about it. And it's understandable in some ways, because if you look at pharmaceutical companies, they can send that cute rep to the doctor's office, take them out to a steak dinner, give them some free samples. Who's gonna do that for keto? Who's yeah. gonna do that for fasting? If we told everyone in the world that, hey, not eating for a couple of days is gonna, truly improve your health, it's not going to be a popular opinion for the economy for no. all those poor people who aren't in keto and are really going to suffer. We really need to do something to change that. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a growing community of people who are very passionate about educating more practitioners who are going to help more patients. And when we started Low Carb USA, we were kind of like you who started out at the beginning where we wanted to teach the individual. And we quickly became, uh, came to the realization that teaching the practitioner was going to be our main, one of our goals because it's so imperative and they reach more through their work. And it also will help with the conflicting information. So the more yeah. practitioner, right, you know, so as the more practitioners learn this and are, or have enough knowledge to recommend it and not um, give um, conflicting advice or, or tell people not to do this. Make sure that the resources are out there. Like your movie's gonna be amazing to raise awareness and teach others and introduce them to the work that um, like we started doing at the very beginning with our conferences and every day we think, how can we reach more people? So everybody, all of us as a community, each one of us that does the work, talks about it, talks to someone else about it, does um, some kind of work that can go to the next practitioner to learn where they don't have to get sick first. Unfortunately, a lot of our practitioners have learned the hard way. Um, we want to get this into medical schools. We want to get this into yes. like, you know, <laughs> we want to get this. And that's why we provide continuing med medical education credits um, so that somebody could see it and plant a seed and say, well, I need these credits anyway. Maybe this information is going to be um, interesting and then maybe plant the seed that they can try it in the next patient or, or um, plant the seed that, that, how can I learn more? A common, unfortunately, it's, it's just a, a, something that people that are keto roll their eyes at is like you go in for chemotherapy and they give you cookies or apple juice, right? And it's just like... I know life is yeah. hard, but we don't want to make it shorter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I do want to emphasize the same thing that you two always emphasize, that no diet is a cure for cancer. We're not promoting that, but it can improve your outcomes. It can improve the efficacy of your treatment, how long you actually survive, and especially the quality of life. And that's really what we want to spread around with this documentary. Just let people know this information is out there to research themselves and to talk with their medical team about and very often your medical team doesn't know as much about it as this film will explain. And if that's the case, you can educate them or you can find another team. Yeah. Yeah. Pam, you mentioned, you know, like, you know, going after the doctors versus going after the patients versus going after the individual. Um, we're hoping to sort of sort of straddle a little bit the patients and I guess even the individual um, and then also um, doctors to a certain degree. I mean, obviously, if you know nothing about this, it's at least a good place to start. Um, we're going to try and 
um, sort of lay out the history of the metabolic theory of cancer. Um, but one of the things that we definitely want to stay away from is like conspiracy theories. Like there's definitely people out there that are sort of preying on people that have cancer. Um, and we do not want to, you know, be one of those. We're going to be very scientifically based, um, you know, research based, um, and then be, be honest and upfront on, you know, what treatments are working, what, what stage those are in, in the research, what, you know, um, we talked a little bit about like the care oncology type, um, off label drugs. Like some of the drugs are already out there and approved for human use, but they've been approved for a different kind of use, but they could be used for cancer. Those, all these things need to just, you know, keep, keep rolling and keep moving. And there are no bad guys in this story. You know, we talk about the doctors don't understand this or that they're doing the best they can. We don't think that any, anyone went into medicine to hurt people. Uh, but sometimes they're just stymied by the protocols, the conventions, and some of the rules of our current world. Yeah. And if that's the case, you have to be empowered, either have your doctor be empowered or be empowered yourself to take control of your health. And that's where we see the best outcomes. Yeah, I think that's so important. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, um, why don't we get back to asking you about the movie project itself and where you yeah. are in that project and how some of the listeners can maybe help you with that. But I just wanted to, to bring up something quickly. When we were talking about doing this podcast, um, Maggie was saying that uh, she won't be a part of it and she'll just let Brad do the talking. Um, the reason for her suggesting that was that as a result of this radiation necrosis that, she's, that she talked about, it leads to issues where sometimes you forget, you can't find words, um, and, and sometimes you can't even understand what, what's being said to you if, if you're having a bad incident. And um, I know a little bit about that from the, from the TBI that I suffer with, and I know how much it took for me to get up on the stage and, and talk at our first conference. Um, and I just wanted to commend you on your courage for being prepared to be a part of it. And I said to you, you need to be on here because it's your story. And, and you're the reason for this movie happening. You're, it's, all, it's all about you. So <laughs> the podcast would be kind of pointless without you. But it still took a lot of courage for you to, to agree to be on it. So um, thank you for doing that. Thank you. I think and it's going to mean a lot to, to, a lot to a lot of people. Thank you for being an inspiration. And you really set that just started this whole movement in my, my head. This community has been incredibly supportive of everything that we've done. And it's thanks to you and others like you that I think if we are just more open about the struggles that we go through, other people will know that their struggles aren't so different. Yeah. That's yeah. Super. As you did yeah. for me. Yeah. This community is fantastic. It's, I mean, I mean, even people that are even trying to do something similar to you, they're like, go do it, you know, <laughs> or you might, might be a competitor, but you know what? We're all in the, we're all moving this in the same direction. Same so, mission, yeah. no competitors. Exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. a billion, billions of people to be reached and it can only reach more people, the more people who talk about this. Um, yes. Diet and lifestyle changes, not eating too much sugar, which is prevalent in every single thing, every place we go, every, almost all the food that we would buy. That's not just one oh ingredient, fresh produce and meat. Um, sugar is added. And so if we can reduce the, the overabundance of sugar and, you know, as you're talking that how sugar feeds cancer cells is what going to be one of the biggest things that you talk about in your movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's over 70% of cancers, especially of late stage cancers are the sugar feeders. These are the ones that show up in a PET scan and the PET scan is actually made to tag these sugar molecules with a radioactive tracer, follow them to the tree more so that they show up on a scan. And that's when people talk about their scans. Uh, that's sugar. That's sugar that's being attracted to the tumor. Like there can be no question that sugar is not a good thing if you don't want your cancer to grow. Uh, I get scared because the only time I ever have sugar is when I get a pet scan. <laughs> Otherwise we eat only whole foods, vegetables, uh, when we're cheating sometimes. I've been two years cancer free. I'll have a fruit. Uh, some very wait you have fruit or you are a fruit <laughs> <laughs> very rarely though uh, mostly vegetables and then rare for us uh 
some pasture raised organic meats. And this is just my personal thing. I was born and raised vegetarian, so it's been challenging for me to get into the meat eating, but we're certainly not opposed to it in any way. And again, our, our film isn't to talk about the treatments specifically in depth. It's really to open people's minds to know that the treatments are out there, to pursue them with the experts who can really describe them best. And to share the history of this evolutionary development of how cancer works that we've had for over a hundred years and haven't taken action against. Um, yeah. I'm totally stealing it, but oh, I have no. to share. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> a big part of the story is how when Otto Warburg uncovered some of this deranged metabolism of cancer in the 1920s, it was a leading contender of you know, the cancer theory. But when DNA was discovered, an amazing discovery by Watson and Crick, everything shifted to DNA. All the money went there. All the great scientists went there because it's so much more exciting than good old you know, biochemistry. Yeah. But we're coming back now, thanks to some of the incredible researchers that we've been able to talk to in this film, and so many more who are following in their footsteps, that it's going, we're finally going to get back to 100 years ago and really make some advances. I have incredible hope for the future of cancer treatment uh, for myself and for others. That's brilliant. Um, yeah. So when we talked previously, you show, were showing me a timeline for this movie project. And if I remember correctly, you kind of finished with the production part of it, and now it's it's all the editing and, and all the hard stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, tell us about how much work is still involved, where you think, when you think this project's gonna be completed. And sure. I think that should segue into um, the fact that that's gonna cost money. And yeah. uh, the fact that there are ways that people listening to this could, could uh, contribute and, and help you guys to get this project finished. Definitely, uh, thank you. Um, and yeah, so it's like just a, very briefly recap the film, it's going to be sort of three parts. So we're going to talk about the history of the metabolic theory of cancer up to now, and then the therapies that are coming out of that. And then we're at the very end, we're going to talk to some people that have used these therapies and how it's making a positive impact on their lives. So that's sort of the timeline of the film. Um, and so we actually already have some clips up on YouTube that you can go and uh, check out. Um, everybody that we've interviewed, we've made a point of making a clip, quick 30 second clip that you could just go and at least, you know, uh, see your favorite people uh, up, on, up on screen. We have a trailer, a two minute trailer up there and a few other little things. So that's youtube.com <laughs> slash cancer revolution doc. You can find all these clips there. Um, so that's, yeah, as soon as we got back, we just started, you know, like cutting these little clips together to get out there and that, and now I'm basically cutting the film every day and behind me, Maggie is hard at work doing uh, fu rate fundraising. So, uh, do you want to do the Indiegogo? Yeah. So first let's, uh, let you know when you can actually see this. Okay. We will be finishing this documentary by the end of April, 2022, maybe the first week of May with our hope and intention being to submit it to the Toronto film festival, in which case it would world premiere in September of 2022. And from there, we're going on the festival tour, just taking it to as many conferences and premieres as we possibly can to get the word out and eventually uh, distribute it on the platform where we can get the most viewers. Because our goal isn't so much the money, it's just to let people know that these exist. The same as you guys are doing, the same as so many members of this community are doing, everyone adding to the pile to let people know that these treatments are real and they really can help humans in your life or yeah. yourself. Um, you go okay. Ahead. Yeah, so how can people give you money? <laughs> <laughs> so right now we have an Indiegogo campaign. It's up at, oh, there's a shortcut for it, but it's on the Indiegogo.com site. If you search for Cancer Revolution. Well, it's at the top of our webpage, right? It's also on our webpage, which yeah. is cancerrevolution-movie.com. Again, Cancer Revolution, one R. <laughs> <laughs> and we're using these funds right now because we finished production to really fund our graphics and having some amazing graphics and very high production uh, quality for this film. I think it's gonna give it the credibility that this movement needs. Uh, I'm already picking out my dress for the Academy Awards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we put, we put a bunch of our own money into it and, you know, traveled around the country and got all these documentary or all these uh, good interviews. And, um, you know, we're at, at home and we just kind of need that like push to get us over the finish line. 
Um, and you can, and we're actually running a special just, uh, or I don't know if it's special, what is it? Uh, yeah, it's a, a dis special a discount for just for your podcast viewers. We put something special yes. together. Um, I'll let you explain it. Yeah, and actually, Doug and Pam, I'll share a link after this. It's a link we set up that will go to a special Indiegogo page with a discounted version of our digital film. So the very moment that we can get it into people's hands, we can do that. It'll be $25. They'll get instant access to, uh, well, the poster for the film, to some of the original music that we've already recorded, and a five-minute clip that Brad put together. And then the moment that the film is done and able to be distributed, we'll send out a link for people to watch it in its entirety, the director's cut uh, for $25, all included. Yeah, so if you just pay 25 bucks to buy the film, you get it when it comes out. Like that's as simple as it gets, right? Yeah, and so that's pre-order, pre-pre-order. Pre yeah. And it goes to fund and the uh, And it goes the to fund the production, exactly, yeah. yeah. And that's just a little cheaper than if you just you know, found our Indiegogo page another way. It's a special thank you just to your viewers. Okay, that's can brilliant. So you're going to send us that that uh, link. I will. And we'll put it in the done. show notes so people can find it there. Yeah. Super. Okay, awesome. And I want to emphasize, though, that this film will be made. We're raising money now, but no matter what, we have everything we need to make it done. We just need to make it great. I need to wear that Academy Award dress. <laughs> but really, we need to get it good enough so that people will listen to what we're saying and have that credibility. And for that, we do need the quality graphics, the quality post-production, um, and that's where we're helping for these generous contributions. Yeah, we're just trying to make sure that it's not one of those documentaries you turn on and then after five minutes, you know, it's like some guy interviewing his brother in his garage, right? And you're like, <laughs> well, I don't, you know, <laughs> there's something to be said for just having a, you know, a certain level of production quality and having a, you know, a high level of, uh, you know, researchers and doctors talking to us. We're really trying to do it correctly and get the, inf the real information across to everyone. It's going to be a grassroots movement, right? This is not something that you it would cost so much money to get the trials done for this and there's so little money to be made off of it it's not going to happen any other way um on that note one of the reasons to be hopeful about metabolic therapies is big pharma is starting to dip its toe in and as i like to say big pharma doesn't gamble so if you see the, the fact that big pharma is starting to try and make some pills that do some of the things that the ketogenic diet does, lower blood sugar, you know, like, you know, you know, fight your cancer by, you know, getting ketones in. That's just a sort of red light going off in my mind of like, hey, you know what, we're onto something. And um, so I, that just makes me really hopeful um, about the future where this is headed. So um, yeah, and I hope, I guess, one of the things that I hope that the government or some government comes up with a way to fund this before maybe big pharma comes out with a pill right because i feel like that could be like a big blow it's like if if you could just keep eating your french fries and just take a pill to not get cancer it that's going to have a cost too and we won't know that for another 20 years right like what that cost was it's like let's not kick this can down the road any further let's actually solve it because yeah, we've, we've seen that happen in the diabetes world. So let's try to get the conversation around how, um, what you're doing every day anyway, you're going to eat. Yeah. If you can just change what you're eating to whole foods, natural uh, vegetables and meats, if you're including them in your diet and fats, natural fats um, that are fueling your body and not fueling the cancer. Yes, that's that's exactly right. right. Yeah. And these treatments have been along for so, or been around for so long, for thousands of years, people have not eaten when they feel poorly. Let's just bring that back. Just don't eat crap at least. <laughs> and it'll make a difference. And to anybody out there who's listening to this because they're dealing with their own diagnosis or a loved one's diagnosis, I wish I could speak to everybody directly and personally, but all I can say is there is hope. There really is, no matter what your doctors say, no matter what Dr. Google says, Believe in yourself, have faith in yourself, know what you want, and you'll be able to get it. I mean, even just the two extra years that I've had are so much more valuable than the way I was living before. I've learned so much from this diagnosis, and I, he disagrees, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's, it's been great for me.
I've heard that from a number of people, Maggie. Um, I think Allison Gannett was one. She had a brain tumor, a primary brain tumor. She says the same thing. She's grateful for her brain tumor. It taught her things that she wouldn't have learned otherwise, and it sent her in, on a path that was different than where she was already headed. And now she's, um, you know, passionate and um, committed to helping others the way you are. Can you just tell people if you wouldn't mind, if you don't mind talking about it on the podcast here, what you were telling us earlier, there was a time where your scans had shown what they thought was um, recurring cancer and explain what your, what you had learned and how you talked to your doctor at that time. Yeah, I'll even start a little bit earlier when I was first diagnosed, where I was completely willing to just give everything up to my doctors. I wanted to treat immediately. Never mind that I probably had this cancer for years, decades, nobody knows. I wanted it out of me. And so I took every recommendation, the chemo, the radiation. On that first radiation, I think was probably great because I hadn't fully come into my metabolic health self. The second radiation that I had, there was some debate whether or not that was necessary. So when my next scans came up saying I had a fifth tumor, this was it, I was gonna die in a matter of weeks, I better get more radiation. We were ready at this time to take our time. Brad had been telling me from the very beginning, there's no rush on this. And we just took our time and we just looked at it from our perspective. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that what we are driving at is just patient advocacy, right? You need to be your own advocate. Um, it's, it's easy to say that your doctor knows everything, but that's not always the case. It's really, I mean, there are every, if you even look at cancer, right? There are just like thousands of different types of cancers. No oncologist, I mean, very few, I should say, are, you know, super specialists in your one kind of cancer that you have. Um, and so uh, in particular with Maggie's story, what happened is that we, uh, we heard someone talk about another type of cancer um, and that it was a brain cancer. And what had happened was, is that even though the brain cancer had gone away, what was left was a brain necrosis and that the, the way that, 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 if that could be misdiagnosed as more cancer. And so then that would be treated with more radiation. But if you don't have more cancer and you have the necrosis, that's actually the wrong, that would be uh, very harmful to the brain. Uh, and so that's what we just, I just happened to hear this and we went back and it wasn't the same kind of cancer, but Maggie went through the same process where they said, hey, you've got some more brain, uh, the, some more brain tumors. And luckily, I mean, honestly, luckily, we had just heard this talk like within a, a few weeks before. And we were like, can we just, have another specialist look at this, you know, let's make sure that this really is cancer. Um, that specialist, we had to ask multiple times to get that. Get to no, actually, I had to I, pay out of pocket in Hong oh, Kong. To pay, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, I knew it took an extra step. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we had to, I'll, I'll interrupt and just say I've had nine oncologists. Actually, one of them was a neurosurgeon, uh, but I've had nine doctors look at this and they all come to different opinions. And it's not their fault that it's not known because people never lived this long with what I have in my head. But more and more people are as honestly, some of the drugs are becoming better. Uh, metabolic therapies are well known. And there are certain treatments for brain radiation necrosis like this that we came to America thinking we're going to get a hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Asana has been great for me. But when I approached my neuro-oncologist about this, who's been my favorite, one of my favorite clinicians, he was absolutely dead set against it because there just wasn't enough research. And this was one year ago. At my appointment just this month, he said, ooh, might be a little bit more activity there. You should get more hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So it's coming out. People know, but they don't know yet. And so don't be afraid to advocate advocate for yourself because the information's coming out, but maybe you can't wait for it. You don't have to wait for your doctors. You can educate them now. Yeah. Yeah. To, to wrap up a like little Hong Kong bit was, yeah, when her scans came back from the specialist, they showed that she didn't have cancer. Her, her doctor was actually wrong. Uh, he wasn't particularly apologetic about it either. That was kind of, we were kind of hoping for a big sorry. You almost killed me, friend. Yeah, exactly. And he was kind of like, well, people make mistakes. Yeah. He said, I normally work with more people. Yeah. So, but so just yeah. know that so, your doctor makes mistakes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, it's yeah. It's a good point to, to bring across. Make sure yeah. that you 
both have all, all have all the information and if you want to look at yeah. stuff and bring it to your doctor say could you look at this more for me you know you we've got your, you go and see your oncologist for gosh if you're lucky like 45 minutes at what months once a month yeah if you're i mean they that's nothing Think about how, like, you live with your cancer. I mean, I'm sorry, I don't have cancer. My wife did. But you live with my cancer. You, know, you live with their cancer. If you have cancer or you're, you know, someone has cancer, you're with it every day, every second. You know how your body mm -hmm. feels. Like, you know what's going on way better than your doctor ever will. And so, you know, you have access to, to Dr. Google, you know, good or bad. You have access to so much information. You know, just take advantage of that. Yeah, don't... Nobody's bad here. Nobody's giving you misinformation because they want you to die. But that could be a consequence of just not staying up to date on everything that's available. I think that's a super way to end this. That's, that's, <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for being with us. And, uh, and uh, we'll get this out as soon as we can and talk about it at our, at our next conference too. Thanks for being with us. Do you want any little anecdotes like about making the film? Would that be funny at all? So when we, you know, first started trying to gather some people to interview for the film. Um, we got Thomas Seyfried on board and that was fantastic. And, and he's, you know, we were trying to find a couple of people from the genetic mutation side to like, you know, tell that side of the story. And so Dr. Thomas Seyfried was like, well, Hey, did you ask Robert Weinberg? And we were like, no. Um, and for those of you that don't know, Robert Weinberg is a giant in the field of cancer. He wrote uh, the hallmarks of cancer he found several oncogenes, which are like the genes that cause cancer. I mean, so, I mean, he's really a, a big deal in that world. Founded the Whitehead Institute, MIT scientist. I mean, he's, he's, he's huge. And so we were like, wow, I guess, uh, you know, Seyfried knows Weinberg, so we should just reach out. So we, we reached out to Weinberg and name dropped Seyfried and, and Dr. Weinberg said yes. And then a couple of days later, we were talking to Tom Seyfried and he's like, oh, wow, Weinberg said yes to you. That's great. I, I didn't think he would do that. And we were like, well, you told us to reach out to him. And he's like, yeah, but I don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that we had in common with Weinberg was that regardless of, you know, uh, or I shouldn't say we, but, you know, like let's say Seyfried and other advocates for the metabolic theory have in common, um, is that regardless of what you think is the origin of cancer, we're all still trying to, to cure it. And we're all sort of upset that we haven't made greater inroads. And so even though he and uh, we and him didn't like jive exactly on how cancer starts, we could still talk about how sad it is that we haven't gone further and the need to keep researching. And that, that which is really like our thesis is that we need to keep fighting. We keep, need to kind of spread, you know, we're kind of get a little too focused on genetics. We need to continue to, to look a little bit wider. And he agreed with that. He was like, yeah, that's true. We, you know, he's like, he didn't, he thinks the genetics is still it, but he's like, we still need to keep looking at, at, a, at a broader aspect. So it was really nice to hear that from, again, a giant in the field. That's, um, super. So that, that's the one. That's, that's the one. Anecdote. <laughs> and then the other one is just uh, sort of uh, logistics, which was, um, uh, in our initial tour of like the first several people that we were going to interview, uh, we were going to go to Toronto to interview Dr. Jason Fung. Um, and so we were driving through Chicago, about to cross the border, and we thought we had clearance. We had spoken with the Canadian government a little bit, just, you know, whatever small, small version of the Canadian government we spoke with. Um, and they thought that we were, you know, working and so we'd be allowed to get in and we were rejected at the border. And so my wife was, oh man, she was, she was devastated. She was like, oh, not right. essential. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> so essential. <laughs> well, one, we weren't, yeah, essential workers, but two, she was like, oh my gosh, she really wanted Jason Fung to be part of the movie. And so uh, unfortunately we just had to let that go. There's nothing really we could do. We were, we were probably going to have to have a crew going, um, uh, and interview him. But what ended up happening is that on five months later, four months later, uh, the, the restrictions got lifted on the border. And uh, we were one of the first people to, you know, book a flight into Toronto to, to go and interview Dr. Fung. But they hadn't changed their signage at the airports yet. And so when we landed in Toronto, it was like, if you're not essential, you're not getting in. And we'd already <laughs> been denied once. 
So we're literally like standing in line, like sweating bullets. I'm like, I mean, I swear there was sweat dripping off my face. I was like, we just landed in Toronto. We're going to have to be here for 30 minutes and get on a plane and go back to the U.S. And we got up in line. They put a big, big red X on our like to get in um, ticket, you know, our, our immigration ticket. They got up there said, hey, please go over to this other room. To, and everyone else is going through. And we were like, oh my gosh, we were like, we just, we, we were like, we put so much into this to have this happen. We get into the other room and he's like, so you guys tried to cross the border recently and we're rejected. And we were like, yeah. And he's like, okay, well, like when that happens, they send you to this other room just to double check, but I'm going to let you through. And we were like, oh my gosh. We were like, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so he's like yeah you might want to like write a letter to this agency to get that lifted and we we're like we're gonna we'll get on that <laughs> but yeah that interview almost didn't happen twice <laughs> but it was worth it it was really like all of our interviews was amazing it was it, it turned out to be one of our best interviews yeah <laughs> you've been listening to an episode of the low carb usa podcast you can support us on patreon at patreon.com slash low carb usa